Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Are you happy to be here this morning? All right. Hey, Kendall, you have an issue with uh, the same one, MH. But uh, don't worry, just go to worship six. We should be good. All right. Hey, today we're focusing on eternity because we have been created as eternal beings. So today, all of our songs will have this one word in common, and that word is forever, because we are in this worship thing forever. Are you guys excited about that? So when we gather here on Sunday mornings, we actually gather here to practice. This is rehearsal for heaven, because when we get to heaven, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be worshiping him forever. All right, let's start. God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures
Yes, it does. His love endures forever. And out of Psalms 136, that's where that comes from. Guess what? It repeats that line 26 times. So you thought, man, we sang that a lot. We didn't sing it 26 times. But in Psalms 136, let me just give you a taste at the beginning. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. You get it. What? His faithful love endures forever. And you know what? We are created eternal beings. That's why we're focusing on eternity today. We've got a new song we want to teach you guys this morning. And the chorus is simple. It goes like this. To you be all the glory, to you be all the honor, forever be praised, forever be praised, for you alone are worthy, for you alone are holy, forever be praised, forever be praised. Does he deserve our praise forever? Let's do that one more time. To you be all the glory, to you be all the honor, forever be praised, forever be praised, for you alone are worthy, for you alone are holy, forever be praised. this song. Be brave. 
lay our lives down here at your feet to the one who's worthy you gave everything turn to your neighbor and tell him we're in this forever Just some more, some more passages here, some more verses just focusing on eternity. Titus 1-2 says, in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. 1 John 2-25, this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Luke 18, verse 30, who, have not, who will not receive many times as much as this time and in the age to come, eternal life. John 6, 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And John 3.16, we all know that whoever believes in him will have what? Eternal life. And to think that God did all this because he wanted us to be with him for eternity. And uh, when you think of the option, you know, it's so easy. It's, it's an easy choice, you know. The Bible says that our, our faith has to be just like children. You look at it, it's an easy choice. But somehow the devil makes us doubt the word of God. So right now, just, just bow our heads and just pray that God would remove all the doubt in your heart. Pray that God would strengthen your faith. That your faith would be strong to know that this is not about what I can see today. This is what God sees in the future. And he has set his future in the word for us. And that future includes us. Father, we thank you for thinking of us. We thank you for forgiving us. We thank you for creating a way, Lord, to bring us back to you after we messed up. And Lord, we've all messed up. Even the author of the Psalms that we are singing, Lord, that we sing on a, on a weekly basis, Lord, he did some pretty bad things, Lord. And yet, Lord, you still loved him. All because, Lord, of his great repentance, and Lord. So we repent of our sins as well, Lord. We confess our sins to you. And we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we will have the strength to repent and change our ways, Lord, a way so that our lives will be walking testimonies of who Jesus is, Lord. We pray that our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members will see eternity in Christ in the way we live and in the way we love. May they see and may they know that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. Amen. Without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
and you rose Arm of heaven held its breath Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not heal, shall not Please be seated. Well, good morning. New name, new identity, new citizenship, new father, new family, new hope. Just a little, little woo. <laughs> Guys, we are in covenant with the living God. We, amen. We, uh, as a family, we, again, we read through the Bible every year. We just got done with, uh, we're in Chronicles, Second Chronicles. Solomon had just, he has, oh, is this our plan? No, we're, I'm confusing my plans. Pastor Juan has a plan I'm doing with him. I can, I'm sorry. I'm in a different plan with Pastor Juan as well. Forgive me. You guys didn't know any of this, and I've just wasted 15 seconds. I'm in another plan. Pastor Juan and I are doing it together. We just got done with Second Chronicles. They had just, uh, Solomon had just gotten done with the temple. The Spirit of God falls. And do you know what the people's reply is? He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may we never forget that he is good and that his faithful love endures forever. In spite of how I feel in the moment, in spite of what I'm going through, his faithful love endures forever. May we cling to that hope, amen? If you are new here, we're excited that you're here. I've already met a couple of you. It's been cool to get to see faces and, and names. Glad that you guys are here. We have a connect card that you all can fill out. It should be in the pew in front of you, or you can go online to our website, bragonjesus.org, and hit the connect button. We also have our offering plates out back. If you're new, we don't just do a mass exodus to do the offering as you leave. You can just drop them off there, or again, you can go online and you can give uh, on our website as well. So glad you're here this morning. I have a guest with me. I don't know if y'all can. I don't know if y'all can. I don't know if can everyone. I'm gonna. I'm moving this so everyone. I don't know if y'all can see her over there. <laughs> so uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm Sophie Brown, and I'm his daughter. It's true. <laughs> she's she's my youngest. I have, said, I have called her Audrey the last two services, so I'm hoping I do not mess this whole thing up. And each time y'all laugh and judge, you guys did the same thing with your own kids. I know you did. When I got in trouble, my name was Andrew Aaron David Brown. I got every name in our whole entire family from my mother. So um, Sophie's with us today. Sophie, why are you here? To tell everybody about Awana. To tell everyone about Awana? Is there another reason you're here? Because you asked me to. All right, I did. <laughs> I did ask her to. So, so okay, so you brought up Awana. What is Awana? Please tell us. Um, Awana, to me, is a place where you can worship God, memorize verses, and have fun. 
All right, cool. And so you're a part of this program. I know my oldest, I'm going to get her name right, Audrey, and then Eli went through it as well. So you worship, you said memorize verses. All right, so let's go off of that for a second. How many verses over maybe the course of an Awana year do you think you would memorize? About 40. 40 verses. 40 verses, amen. <laughs> now we clap, but think about the power of that. Kindergarten through sixth grade. Seven years, seven times 40. My fourth grade math is kicking in. That's 280 verses. In a world where, we're, where truth is muddied, where, where um, a biblical worldview is not the norm, 280 verses. And so as a father, as a parent, I'm excited about Awana. I know um, the Reckonwald family, they're here at our church because as they were driving by one day, as they were looking for a church, they saw a big banner outside that said Awana. And Erica had exposure and been through the Awana program as a, as a young person. And so they wanted to be a part of a church. I'm sure there's other things that drew them as well, but that was something that they saw. So praise the Lord for our Awana ministry. Thankful for that. So now when you're at Awana, is it just you just hanging out? Like who's there with you? Well, there are volunteers for gym time, lesson time, and uh, memorization. So there's a bunch of people that have to volunteer to make this happen. I was talking to Pastor Juan the other day, and he said, man, Awana's a big, big church deal. Like, you need all hands on deck. And so with that being said, we're having kind of our kickoff or sign-ups for volunteers. As you go outside, in the, right next to the life group wall that we just erected, we have a sign-up list. Tim Thomas, who's going to be one of our directors and leaders this year, he'll be waiting for you if you'd like to get some more information, pray about it. But here's what I ask. As a parent, again, who's been affected and how my own family has been discipled, I want to say thank you. I, I'm, I'm tempted to have everyone stand up. I bet you there's hundreds of people in this room that have either been affiliated with their own children or have served in some sort of capacity in the past. Thank you for discipling my family. Let us continue. Yeah, amen. Can we, can we continue this? Can we as a church continue the opportunity to have scripture hiding in the words of our youth, of our church, and in our community? Amen? Amen. So August 23rd is we're kicking off uh, Awana. We're having a training on August 13th. I'm providing lunch for all the workers, and so I'd invite, if you can, to be a part of that process. Again, the sign-ups are out there. If you have your own children, please go online and register as soon as you can as well. So, Sophie, thank you for being here with us today. Would you uh, pray us into our service? Pray for, uh, for a blessing for both the service and Awana coming up. Dear God, I pray, pray your blessing for this service and for Awana coming up, and in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. The moon and stars, they went. The morning sun was dead, the Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake.
sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb has overcome we sing hallelujah Thank you, Shanna. Good morning. Whoa, dropping things here. Oh, goodness. We're continuing through the letters of the New Testament. And this week and next week, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews. Now, Hebrews is a really complicated book to understand. It's really difficult to just overall understand it. The title is really a tough one, Hebrews. It's written to Hebrews. So, it's written to and about Hebrews. Uh, the Jewish people, the biological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the idea being that God has worked through the Jewish people historically, and they're scattered and have been for millennia all over the world. A few years ago, I'm in Beijing, China. I'm in a store that's the functional equivalent of the Chinese big lots. That's the rough, rough analogy. And I'm just browsing through the store and here walks a guy by me that's a Hasidic Jew. I mean, he's all dressed with, you know, black with the frontlets, and I'm going, go figure. And then, correspondingly about the same, I'm, I'm doing this to illustrate how Jewish people are everywhere, even though there's 15 to 16 million of them that are biological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob on the face of the earth. Um, the fact that they're so dispersed is amazing. And then subsequently, after that experience, and I did uh, research, and uh, the research is online through the degree I was finishing, and I get this random email from a guy who's a doctoral student at Bar Ilan University in Israel, and he has found a reference to some... Uh, resources and documents that I had in my research that he cannot get his hands on for his research and he's emailing me to ask him to help him get these documents for the purposes of his research and lo and behold the guy is obviously Jewish and he is doing research on Sino-Judaism Chinese Judaism and I've seen this guy in big lots in Beijing a couple years before, and I'm, my head is spinning. That's all to say in somewhat of a semi-humorous fashion that there is a diaspora of Jewish people around the world, these Hebrew people. At the same time, there is a, a designated specific place in the world that was willed to an inheritance of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the Middle East, and it's known as the modern state of Israel. So here's a little video to go with that.
So as you can see, we are having an interest meeting, informational meeting on Sunday night, August the 6th at 6 o'clock here at the Deltona campus in the Children's Ministry Chapel down the hall this way for anyone who would be interested in a trip to Israel next May, as you can see by the information. Again, there's no obligation for attending this meeting. The point is to get information about that and to see if maybe you'd like to follow up on that. And so for all of you who are interested, you'd certainly be welcome to come and, and you can find out what's involved. I remember years ago when I went to Israel and I had someone explain to me, a pastor friend, he said, you know, Brad, you've been reading a two-dimensional Bible. He said, when you, when you go to Israel and you go to the Middle East there and you visit the biblical sites, after that you'll be reading a three-dimensional Bible. And, and, and the analogy I could use would be to say, you know, Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. He said, you know, a man went from Jerusalem to Jericho, and there's a road of, of trail. People walked that. That was a familiar spot to everybody. I mean, they knew he's talking about. But for us, if we've never been in that place, we think of it, and it's sort of obscure, in, even though we can look at pictures. But just imagine if the, if the Bible said that somebody was walking from Deland to Deltona, and this and this and this. I mean, how much, how would that change our perception and our perspective of it? And it would be three-dimensional, so to speak. Furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, and this is a segue back into the message on the book of Hebrews, is that I remember distinctly the first night that I was there, the plane landed probably 1 o'clock in Tel Aviv or somewhere around there, and we went, of course, to our hotel. And I remember standing outside and just having the impression to say, you know, of, of all the world, this is a piece of ground that I'm standing on that was has a title deed and an inheritance from God Almighty to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. And that is a significant and fascinating um, concept and experience. But that being said, today we're going to talk about wills. We're going to talk about wills. We're going to talk about what a will is and how it's relevant to us as followers of Jesus the Messiah. Now understand, as a preface to the passage we're going to read in Hebrews chapter 9, that the word will the word testament and the word covenant in English are all three words that are equally accurate translations into English of the one word in Hebrew or in Greek, will or covenant or testament. In other words, we have three different words in English that can really similarly refer to the same thing, but if you read the Bible in its original language, there's only one word in the original language that would be rendered in any of those three words. And the reason it would be rendered maybe differently in a different place is simply because the context in which the word uses is a, a nuance of that that indicates which of those English words would best represent it. And it so happens that the passage we're going to be reading and looking at today in Hebrews 9 is a passage where the most prominent and most accurate rendering of that word in the original Greek in which it was written would be the word will. Will. And in, in the event that there are or anyone listening that doesn't understand what a will is, but basically a will is a legal document that someone composes that defines what will be done with their possessions and the things over which they have somewhat control in this life after they have died and how those possessions will be treated and distributed and whatnot. That's what a will essentially is. 
So now let's look at Hebrews 9, and I'm not going to ask you to read it with me because I'm going to stop and comment accordingly and occasionally. But let's set the bigger picture in Hebrews chapter 9. First of all, as we look at the book of Hebrews, as we look at the letters in the year of the apostles this year, then the big picture of the book of Hebrews I actually covered in this week's Bible talk, which is online. It, every week the Bible talk first streams at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night. You can find that on our church website, um, bragonjesus.org, and then you go to the links that talk about streaming and video. But the idea being that this past week in the Bible talk, I gave a flyover of the book of Hebrews, sort of a 30,000-foot view of Hebrews that gave the big picture. And the essence of that is that the book of Hebrews seems to have been written based on the content of the book and the title of the book. It was written to people who were Jews, who were believers, who were being coerced to abandon their exclusive faith in Jesus and to try to partially depend upon themselves by being able to adequately fulfill the law of Moses or other things in order to be fully right with God. I remember one time talking to a man who was a professing believer in Jesus who was Jewish, and he was. Um, we were just talking about uh, the Bible and theology, and I, I asked him, I said, do you, do you need to, to, tr to trust only in Jesus to be justified? In other words, to be made right with God, to be forgiven of your sins, to have a relationship with God, and to have the gift of eternal life. He said, no, any, anything but... You know, I'll just trust in, in Jesus. I said, great. I said, do you, have to, do you have to try to keep the law of Moses? You don't have to try to keep the law of Moses to be justified, but do you have to try to keep the law of Moses to be sanctified? In other words, to be made holy, to really grow and mature and become the, the Christ follower that God wants you to be. And guess what? He wouldn't answer my question. He wouldn't answer my question because... He, he, was, he was betraying the fact that, that he believed that in order to really be righteous, you had to do more than trust Jesus. And I think the writer of Hebrews is addressing that issue in the life, especially of all believers, but especially of the Jewish believers that are being addressed in this book. And we get to chapter 9, and the theme of the book is better, that Jesus is better than anything you've had before. The analogy I love to use is why would you trade in a brand new showroom ready car for one that's 30 years old and won't even run? Okay, that, that's essentially the question that the writer of Hebrews is asking the recipients. Is that question. So, so Jesus is better. He's better than Moses. He's better than the, the, the new covenant. He's better than the first covenant, etc., etc., etc. And we get to chapter 9, and he's talking about the fact that Jesus' sacrifice is better than any sacrifice that was made in the tabernacle. Now, another fascinating thing about the book of Hebrews when you read it, what you discover is that it's saturated with reference to scriptures from the Older Testament, right? But... It's interesting to me that when the writer talks about the, the worship of Israel under the Mosaic Covenant, he never talks about the temple, only talks about the tabernacle, only talks about the tent. In other words, all of the comparisons and the analogies of how Christ is better are used in conjunction with Israel pretty much in the wilderness. I find that a fascinating nuance. I have no idea why. I have no idea why that's significant. I just think it's fascinating. But that being said, we get to chapter 9, and he talks about the better sacrifice. And the bigger context there, in fact, early on in chapter 9, he makes a, a dramatic statement that reinforces the Old Testament. See, our perception, and I think it's, it's a false perception and a minimalist perception, many times of Israel uh, pre-Jesus is you had the tabernacle and the temple and the way folks got forgiveness and the way they followed God and whatever, whatever, especially the issue of forgiveness was through the, t the tabernacle or the temple and the sacrificial system. 
Well, if you read, for example, in Leviticus chapters 1 through 4, then what you discover is that none of the sacrifices in the tabernacle or the temple were for intentional sin. Zero. With the exception of thievery. And I think you get to chapter 5, maybe it is, in Leviticus, and you read in there where if someone steals something, they can be forgiven if they restore what was stolen, they add 20% to it as a penalty, and then they go to the temple and do a certain service. The Ten Commandments, for example. Eight of the Ten Commandments carried a death sentence. The only two that don't are coveting. Well, how do you prove coveting? I mean, that's an attitude, right? How do you prove that? Um, certainly you can see the evidence of it, but it's hard to prove an attitude. The other is theft that I just mentioned. The other eight commandments, if you find the, the corollary to that commandment in the Mosaic Law and the punishment associated with it, all eight of them carry the death sentence. Even dishonoring parents is a death sentence in, in, in the Mosaic Law. So none of the sacrificial system covered that. That's the reason David, King David of Israel, you know, he, we, we know from, from the account in the book of Samuel that David committed adultery and he murdered the woman's husband with whom he committed adultery to try to cover it up. So he had adultery and murder on his account. Well, guess what? Both of them death death in God's economy and in God's justice and so that being said that being said you see evidence in Psalm 51 which is David's prayer for forgiveness he makes an amazing statement he said sacrifice and offering you would not desire else I would give it why because he knew there wasn't any sacrifice for murder there wasn't any sacrifice for adultery you're dead in Numbers 15, it goes down a litany of sins and so forth and the, the sacrifice and, and, and all that's connected with them. It says, unintentional, 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 unintentional. And then it says, abruptly, but if anybody sins intentionally, in other words, it literally says with a high hand, if anybody sins intentionally, they are to be cut off and that's, that's a figure of speech for executed. So there, there was no sacrifice at the tabernacle or the temple for intentional sin except theft. And the writer of Hebrews reinforces that in chapter 9, which we're looking at today. As early on in the chapter, if you read it, what the writer says is, is that even Yom Kippur... Even the Day of Atonement in the fall of every year, the highest holy day where there's, you know, uh, the, the, the priest goes into the Holy of Holies and whatever, whatever, even that, the writer of Hebrews says, was for unintentional sin. Unintentional sin. And, and, and so, you know, everybody, everybody knows uh, the Day of Atonement in the fall. I, I, I have a lot of... Uh, uh, some, some Jewish friends, some guys that were Jewish friends that says when they grew up, it was really drilled into them to really observe Yom Kippur. And, and the, the standard that's used in Judaism is Sandy Koufax, <laughs> the great baseball pitcher. Because Sandy Koufax refused to pitch in the World Series on Yom Kippur. So he's using, you know, Sandy Koufax can't pitch, you can't break it either. <laughs> so there's a great analogy. It's out of Third Opinion, Chapter 2. But anyway, that's the big picture context of where we are in Hebrews chapter 9. So let's, let's, let, I'm going to read, and, and you can follow along. It, it'll be on your screen. That is why he is the one, that's speaking of Jesus, who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant. 
Notice that phrase, eternal inheritance. We're talking will terms here. Now, when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. Why? Because blood is a metaphor for death in the Bible. When Jesus says, this is the new covenant, this is the new will in my blood at the Passover meal with his disciples, which we celebrate at the Lord's Supper, the covenant meal for believers, for Christ followers. The, the cup represents the blood of Christ, and that is emblematic of death because the Bible says life is in the blood. So the spilling of blood is death. So death is a meta, or pardon me, the blood is a metaphor in the Bible for death. And so, in other words, even under the old covenant, when Moses uh, ratified it with the people. They sp sprinkled blood and that bl of the animals that were sacrificed, and that was all emblematic and a picture of, of, of the death that was necessary for the covenant to be ratified. Now, the idea being that a will is what? What is a will? Well, first of all, it's the characteristics of a will are multifaceted, and I don't claim to be um, an attorney that would specialize in the same. But first of all, a will is supposed to be non-negotiable. <laughs> now, there's a lot of litigation to the contrary, uh, especially if you're a Hollywood star or something. You see stuff about that on TV all the time. But the idea is that a will is non-negotiable. Secondly, a will is unilaterally um, in, in its origin. In other words, the person who is the one who makes the will, the testator, as the term would be, that person originates the will. Okay, here's what I want to do with my stuff. <laughs> you know, and here's what it's going to be. So they originate it. It's, it's nobody, nobody else can, can, can it's not a... a, a a, a combined affair, so to speak. If they own it, they have the power to say what's going to happen to it when they die, so to speak. Furthermore, as we've emphasized in the text, it only takes effect when the person who made it dies. You know, you make a will, it, it's, it's, not, it, it, it's not activated, it's, it's not effective until the person who made it is certified as having died. And then thirdly, wills are written. Wills are written, right? In other words, they're written and they're signed and they're witnessed. They are a written record of the person's wishes with regard to their possessions, etc., when they die. Now, where's this headed? Well, the Bible says that, and what the book of Hebrews is emphasizing, is that Jesus came along with a, a new covenant. And this new covenant, just like the old one, had to be enacted with the emblem of death from animals. This new covenant had to be enacted and put in force with the death of the one who made it. Do you see that? So Jesus, when he died, Jesus made valid and made effective in the sense that it was ready to be executed the will that he himself made the new covenant with Israel that, hallelujah, the Gentiles got invited to partake of. But then, 
what happened after that? Jesus died, but then he rose again. Now, here's something interesting. The average will has, in Florida, I think the term is personal representative, maybe. Uh, I may be wrong on that, but I think every, every state has a different term. Most states have the term executor. Um, in other words, they're specified in the will who's to be the person that's going to be the person that makes sure this will is carried out. And they take the steps when the person dies to enact the will. And again, like I say, I think it's personal representative in Florida maybe, but it's executor in most places. And it's not the person who made the will because they're dead, right? But guess what? Jesus rose again. Jesus is the executor of his own estate. He doesn't have to have anybody else. Jesus rose again, and he rose to put his will in effect in people's lives. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that remarkable. I mean, <clears throat> the first time I realized that, I was literally riding down the road in the car listening to somebody talk on the radio about Hebrews, and all of a sudden it came to me, and then the guy who was making the talk said what I had just thought, and man, I got to shouting <laughs> right in the car. And it was out on a veteran's memorial, you know, goes in front of Walmart, goes down that way, I can tell you right where it was, I can tell you the stoplight, where all of a sudden it came, wait a minute, Jesus is the executor of his own estate. He died, and he's got his will, and he's dishing out to the beneficiaries the great promises of his will. So how, how do we receive that? How do we get in on that? <laughs> I remember one time going to a, a family gathering. I had a cousin, and I think the, he was uh, very wrong. But he said, you know, I've done some research, and I think we have some royalty in our background. I said, yeah, if serfs are royalty, we got them. But, uh, but I said, well, I'll tell you what, where's my cut? <laughs> I said, I want my cut now. Well, folks, I want to tell you, in Jesus Christ, we have an inheritance from the ultimate royalty, the God who made and owns the universe. And when the Bible says that God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever depends on him has eternal life and will not perish, that is our inheritance in Jesus Christ from God himself. That's the inheritance of the believer. That's what we celebrate. I mean, who could be richer than that? So how do we receive that inheritance? Well, first of all, we've got to recognize that we are unworthy orphans in need of forgiveness and a heavenly father. You know, this concept that everybody in the world is a child of God is not biblical. It's nowhere, The Bible doesn't say that. You may believe that, but the Bible disagrees. The Bible says that... We have to be adopted as God's child through Jesus Christ, the unique and only Son of God. And so we're spiritually orphans without Christ. And we have to recognize that we aren't just orphans, but we're unworthy orphans in need of forgiveness and a heavenly Father. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I, we saw the movie... Um, Sound of Freedom that's been out that's about uh, child slavery and uh, the hor hor horrific uh, issues of sex trafficking. And, and i got to tell you, it, it, it's exhausting to watch that movie. It is literally exhausting. Uh, the intensity of that for two straight hours was just about more than I could take. And, uh, and that being said, you come away with a sense of 
what you would hope would be righteous indignation for anybody that would do that, especially to a child. I mean, you you come away with this sense of, well, no punishment is too severe for somebody that would do something like that. And that certainly is not illegitimate. But the reality is, too, I have to be honest about the fact that without Jesus Christ and the grace of God, so go I. In other words, without the grace of God, I am capable of that. It's only the grace of God through Jesus Christ that makes me hate that. That's the life of Christ. Hating sin and loving what is good and hating it in our own life more than anybody else's. And until we come to grips with the fact that we are completely, completely deserving of punishment and need to be rescued by Jesus, we never come to the place of truly knowing what it means to trust Him for forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. The second thing is, remember a will is unilaterally originated. It's the will of the testator. It's also written down. You got a Bible? Anybody here got a Bible? Guess what? That's his will. He originated it, and he had it written down. And it's full of the promises of his will for his beneficiaries, for his glory and honor. And so the second thing you do is you bring the will into the throne room. Father, I stand in front of you not deserving anything but death and punishment. But because of Jesus and the promises that he made and the, and the forgiveness that he authors, offers through his own death and resurrection, I claim my inheritance in Christ for his sake. Read the promises in the Bible and insert your name in them. And recognize that's his inheritance for his people. And what is then the inheritance? You know, because usually when we think of inheritance, we think of what? Money, 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 money. Money. Money, 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 money. Right? Don't we? You know? It's better than money, it's what money could never buy. What we inherit is the life of Jesus himself that not only beats sin in this life, it beats death. We receive the very life of Jesus. He died, listen to this, he died to give us himself. And if that, may I suggest, if that doesn't stir your heart and if that doesn't ignite a passion in you to seek Him, you don't know who Jesus is. Straight up. You don't have a clue. You need to open your Bible and get your nose in it and find out who He is. Because once you discover who He is, nothing else will matter. Nothing else will matter. And everything will matter that matters to him. Now, lastly, we talk about a will. We've got the last piece of a will that is really a first world modern problem. We got a first world modern problem. And that's something that 99% of the people that live now and have ever lived and have never heard of. And that is we created a new legal entity in our culture called a living will, right? And a living will is essentially, Pam and I have one and many I'm sure do, a living will is essentially if you're in a medical situation, uh, it gives 
the medical professionals and your family directions as to what your wishes is as to how you would be treated in terms of artificially sustained or not or whatever no, do not resuscitate what, whatever that may be or resuscitate it can say whatever you want it to say but my point is that's called a living will but the sad part is it's connected to death <laughs> isn't it I mean it's connected to death I'm sure many of you have had the heartbreaking experience of having a loved one that was at a terminal time in their lives and th this was a real issue and it, it's gut-wrenching it is literally gut-wrenching decades ago I had to stand in a intensive care room with a couple that were friends of ours whose 17 year old daughter had been in a car wreck and she was I don't know what the medical term is but brain dead I mean her her organs were artificially being stimulated to you know but she was gone and to be there when the plug had to be pulled and it was it was I, you, you don't want that is a scenario that is horrific amazing sequel to that is about six years later I had another friend I ran into he was with his brother introduced me to his brother and his brother had gotten her heart same girl who what are the odds but, that, but that's a living will, right? That's what living... Well, folks, a living will is not a new idea. It's just been changed into its purpose. The Lord Jesus Christ instituted a living will. And He's living to execute it and to dispense the blessings. And that living will is called the new covenant in the Bible. And Jesus lives to give it to you. And you know what? There's a last truth about a will. The beneficiary... Have you ever seen the things they advertise sometimes through the legal system and the government? All these unclaimed... Uh, benef you know, you, you've seen that on the news. People, they got, you know, stuff sitting around that it belongs to somebody, but they never show to pick it up. I mean, the will is there... But it has to be received and accepted by the beneficiary. Jesus lives to dispense the blessings of his life. But it has to be received. bow your heads and thank God for including us in his will our eternity is based on this document that we believe in by faith you thank him let's praise him
So what's next? As I was, you know, as we were singing at the end, like, if Pastor Brad didn't put the response right on the platter, if you are not in covenant with God, if you are not a part of the family of God, if you are not a recipient of the living will of God, I'm just asking you, would you just, would you, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what else could require more celebration and more freedom. If you have never given your life to Christ and you've never experienced the living hope that is the living Son of God in your life, would you just, I don't, I don't know if you have to run down, I don't know if you have to push people out of the way. If Christ was literally alive and standing in, the, in his body, I know he's alive, don't, don't email me later, I know he's alive. If, if he was standing next to me and just said, come, would you do it? Don't lose this opportunity. And for those in Christ, I have this challenge for you. Are you experiencing his inheritance right now and how you're living? Ephesians says that we are seated with him. Colossians says my life is hidden with him. In other parts, it's not me, but Christ in me. And here's what I would ask. If you are not experiencing the freedom, the authority of Christ, that's why we pray for healing. That's why we ask for forgiveness. That's why we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because it's Jesus, it's his ministry at work. And so I would invite you, if you want more of Christ, if you want more of the fullness of Christ, we have elders here to pray. If you need healing in your body, let Jesus' living will activate inside of this mortal body and come and get prayed for. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Jesus. What a God. What a God. You could be a God that is angry and hateful, and while you do have wrath, Father God, you are also full of love and merciful. You gave us the law but we couldn't, we couldn't. Our, our sinful nature was too much. And then you, then you sent your son, and he could. And he is, and he will, and he always. Jesus, may we receive the fullness of you this morning. Maybe for the first time, but for those, Lord, who have made that decision, may they sit and rejoice and receive your inheritance today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And we thank you for this truth. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.